works. <laughs> so, uh, but this is actually great because uh, I know we're doing a recording of this. And so um, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to clap so I can cut right what I said, all that stuff out and pretend like I'm starting to talk here. So uh, give it up for Matt with the Shemi. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. All right, so tonight I'm going to talk to you about Pocket Protector, which is an application that lets you manage your secrets as code. Let's get, so secrets. Anyone here got secrets? Let's see. I prepared a little uh, compare and contrast for those who uh, you know, need a refresher on what secrets may be. So we, on one hand, we've got family secrets. Uh, and on the other hand, we have dev secrets. And these are two very different things, uh, even though we use the same word for them. For instance, with family secrets, we've all got one. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, they're great at parties. Everyone likes gossip. Everyone likes to, uh, you know, uh, play around with that stuff. Um, they're also a fun way to burden a friend, you know? <laughs> Anyone here going to keep in secrets? Yeah, of course not. And that's why if you share it once, you're going to regret it always. Uh, but um, yeah, so because we all know what you did last summer. Uh, so with family secrets, we try to forget. Dev secrets, on the other hand, they basically they come with the job. So if you are deploying an application that talks to an API or something like that, you've probably dealt with dev secrets. They're terrible at parties. Nobody cares about your high entropy XV base 64, like it ends with two equal signs for some reason. Um, they're, they're very boring. People aren't entertained by them at parties. Uh, but they're super useful otherwise. Uh, you share them thousands and thousands of times a day, probably with every API request that you're making from your application. And uh, they're changing all the time. Don't you wish family secrets could do the same? So anyways, let's make it work with dev secrets. Uh, so, devs need secrets. We've got database passwords, API keys and tokens, SSL certificate passphrases, SSH, uh, like public key or private key passphrases for that matter too. So there's many, many places you would need to have a short, very hard to guess string. That's basically what we're talking about here. So um, here's basically the very first strategy that ever <laughs> happens with uh, secrets. Somebody just picks up the API key, presses the copy the clipboard button, and then copies it into their code, and then checks that into the Git, and then now you, people can just search it on GitHub and find your secrets. Uh, so this is definitely the, the earliest and easiest form of integration, and uh, better hope that you trust your hosting environment. Approach number two is to put them in the config. So if you use environment variables or something like that at work, then you know, you're just pasting this into your CI config or your uh, you know, production configs environment variables. Um, you know, we've, maybe you have Django site and you have put it in settings.py. Uh, and realistically, settings.py is not any more secure than your code. So really you've just got two problems. Ah, and here we are with the environment. This is the big one, like, this is kind of the right thing to do, but the problem with this is that as you add more secrets, you have to be revisiting your environment variables every time, and you're going to be having uh, eventually dozens and dozens of these environment variables across dozens of environments, and you're going to lose track. That's the problem. So what's the solution? Secret management, approach number one, password managers. Anyone here use one pass or any of the other more uh, unfortunately named ones? Keep, keep ass. Anyways, uh, <laughs> last pass, keep pass, et cetera. They focus on individual consumers, and they aren't really built for teams, especially not dev teams. I know that at our work, customer support uses it to, like, you know, great effect. But, uh, you know, as developers, we feel like we can do a little better. So you can use a key management service. Uh, so there are enterprise solutions like Vault or hardware security modules that Amazon will rent you usage of. Um, and the problem with those is that they don't really scale down. So you have to run a service, and that means that now you have to run a service for your dev environment as well, or you have to like have some extra component in your Docker Compose or something that basically makes stuff look like production locally. So, um, you know, scaling down is a problem with those. Um, and so here's something that scales down. Has anyone here heard of Git Crypt? 
Oh, okay. A couple of people. So yeah, Gitcrypt is this thing that lets you store secrets in your Git, but using kind of a complicated uh, approach to do it. And it's easy to misconfigure. And before you know it, now that you, you accidentally pushed something and the Gitcrypt wasn't configured right, and now you've got to go uh, change your secrets. <laughs> so rotate them all. So yeah, here's the point of the infomercial when stuff turns back to color. There's got to be a better way. So <laughs> for this, I'll introduce to you Pocket Protector. It's a pocket-sized secret management. Um, it's basically allowing you to use secrets as code. We're back to the ease of that first step, but with the security of the last. So you can safely and explicitly manage secrets in your repo. You can have something called protected.yaml, which I'll show you in a moment. So yeah, this uses state-of-the-art encryption. It's built on top of uh, sodium, NACL, if you've heard of this stuff. It's using typical, like, very standard stuff per the docs, which is how you want your security to be. Um, but the newest and very best, memory hard crypto. So Argon2 uh, and Curve25519 two key. Uh, you know, it is all in this configuration known as a NACL secret box. So this allows, a, it's, it's designed to be multi-user and multi-environment in the same way that a typical dev team is. So at Simple Legal, we have a, you know, dozen or so developers uh, in more than a dozen or so like environments, uh, but basically we have sort of like the secrets segmented per environment. I'll show you how we do that in a moment. So first, I'll introduce some concepts. First of all, we have uh, this concept known as a domain. And these are really just namespaces. Python, we love namespaces. Let's do more of those. In this case, uh, you can, this allows you to organize your keys by your app and your environment. An example of a domain, as you'll see, is like dev versus prod. Key custodians, these are registered users. Key custodian is a term that we would use at PayPal, and I can only assume is somewhat industry standard. So. Um, basically, your repository is probably already protected as far as write is concerned, and there's like SSH keys involved, and there's audit trails, and people are authorizing people per repo. Um, so we leverage those write, write, write permissions to your repository, um, but basically the key custodians need to have passphrases in order to read the encrypted stuff back out. So this is a pretty interesting property of Pocket Protector. It's actually easier to write than it is to read. Um, but really, like with security stuff, that's kind of what you expect. So um, registered users uh, with, so if you're an owner, that means that you have access to a particular domain. Uh, you're like a key custodian, uh, and someone has granted you access to the domain that they are a key custodian of as well. It's a way for teams to sort of extend the security to their peers. Um, yeah, so let's see. Conceptually, I, I really should make a slide for this, but basically conceptually, the way uh, we've come to explain this is like, imagine uh, your neighbor wants you to have access to their mailbox. What if they just went to your mailbox and put the key to their mailbox in your mailbox? Now your key to your mailbox gives you access to their mailbox. This is how the key sharing happens internally. This is how owners grant each other access to domains. Uh, so every like mailbox has a key. If you have a shared mailbox that many people should have access to, then you sort of need to uh, use two key crypto to uh, grant that access. It's a, we have a whole tutorial doc that explains it a little bit better than that. All right, but down to the actual practice of doing it. Sorry, this is a, it's a little bit light on the screen, but basically, first you start by pip installing Pocket Protector. It is actually pip installable. Um, then you init the uh, protected. And this is just a file that you're gonna check into your Git repo. So um, it tells you you're adding a new key custodian. What should be the email for that key custodian? Alice at example.com. You type the passphrase, you confirm the passphrase. Standard stuff. Now you have an actual, uh, protected.yaml, and next time you run Pocket Protector, it's going to pick up that protected.yaml in that working directory, and you're going to, uh, say, add a domain. And remember, it's very easy to write to protected.yaml. It's just a text file. That's why Pocket Protector doesn't really bother uh, enforcing 
any write protections. It doesn't make sense. It's just a text file that you can read and edit. We'll take a look at it in a moment. So it doesn't ask you for a passphrase. It just gets straight to the point and says, well, what's the name of the domain that you want me to add? So next we uh, say add secret. Um, and again, right, you just get the domain name, the secret name, and then we put the secret value 5CA1AB1E, which looks like scalable if you squint. So <laughs> anyways, basically uh, adding a secret doesn't require any particular authorization. You just uh, tell it which domain to add that secret to. So the reason this is very useful is because now any developer is empowered to just get their API-based feature done, throw the secret into the code, um, or the code, the protected.yaml, and other developers can pick that up without ever knowing really the secret themselves, you know? All right, and then finally, we have maybe the most important operation, reading that secret back out. Here, you say decrypt domain dev, and it gives you back a machine-readable JSON of that domain's keys. So uh, that one was called API key. Here you can see the JSON is API key and scalable after you've authenticated. So once you've got that, uh, ah, yes. So it's worth noting that the credentials can come from either standard in or environment variable or a file, which is useful when you have something like Docker secrets. So um, this integrates well with what we use, which is Heroku and GitLab CI and also some Docker Compose stuff. Um, but also we do a lot of stuff interactively too. So that's why we can type in the username and password. Um, but yeah, once you're done that, then you can just uh, git commit and git push. So um, you're free to try it out right now. You can pip install it and play around. Uh, but it, for the rest of us who aren't going to do that, I'll tell you uh, how it works kind of under the hood. So again, protected.yaml is something you're meant to check in and something that is meant to be safe for everyone on the team to read, even if they're not authorized to see the actual secrets. This is even though it's checked in, this is still secure. This is all protected by, you know, top of the class security. Uh, but uh, so if you just cat the protected.yaml, you'll see that we have that dev domain that we created with the secret dash API underscore key that we added, and then a whole bunch of uh, gobbledygook that is basically base64 encoded encrypted uh, secret box data. Um, we have the owners listed here. It, this tells me that alice at example.com has access to the dev domain. And uh, key custodians, which is just a top level thing that's separate from all of the actual namespaces for keys, which just tells me all the potential people who may be able to be granted access to the domains that are in the file. And uh, this one's just for fun, but uh, it helps a little bit better than looking at git commits or git blame. You can actually see an audit log here. So you can see what happened. We created the key custodian, we created the domain dev with owner Alice at example, and we added secret API key in dev. So if you want a quick summary of what's happened, you just jump to the bottom of the file where the audit log is located, and you can uh, check out how protected.yaml has been updated. Um, by the way, I, should, I have been working on this lately, and I forgot to update that basically right here, we also have the date and time and so forth, which helps you sort of orient yourself a little bit better. So yeah, like I said, it's YAML, which means it's compact, it's readable, it's Git blameable, um, and you can sort of get a quick sense of who's doing what. It's pretty easy to see if a file was tampered with, and if so, who did it, that kind of thing. So, beyond the slide deck here, there's a lot of stuff that Pocket Protector supports. Um, all these sorts of uh, activities of like viewing the audit log and so forth. You don't need to open the protected to do so. You can just use the built-in commands. And uh, so we have a shorter version of accessing it called pprotect. Um, I'll be honest with you, this is a little bit of an inside joke because this is based on some of the concepts we learned while at PayPal, so we thought it'd be fun to have something that started with PP, uh, which is like PayPal. Anyways, <laughs> let's see them sue me for that. All right, so uh, yeah, basically there's a lot of stuff you can do here. You can rotate domain keys, you can set the key custodian's passphrase if they feel like updating their passphrase, and uh, you can update secrets and you know, all of these uh, types of activities are just managed through the command. You never actually need to uh, modify the protected.yaml manually. So 
as far as next steps, today we've got something that's way better than the alternatives. I'll tell you now we've been using Pocket Projector in production at Simple Legal for over two years, and it's been pretty worry-free. Um, it's in a multi-app, multi-environment use. It's on PyPI and GitHub. Uh, it has a fancy new CLI that is, uh, what do you call it, built on this framework called Face. Feel free to take a look at that. And uh, it's also Python 3, so um, that's a recent uh, sort of port. And, you know, you'll be very relieved to know that it is future-proof in that regard as well. Uh, as far as planned features, so there are a couple of things that we've been wanting to uh, do for a while but haven't exactly needed. One is quorum-based recovery. So uh, I was kind of involved with writing uh, the Wikipedia article for uh, Shamir's Secret Sharing. Say that three times. Uh, but basically, Shamir Secret Sharing is a way that you can have um, multiple people uh, use their passwords to unlock kind of like another password. But you need like multiple people to turn the key at once. Uh, and so what's fun about this is we were planning a feature where if someone forgets their password and they're the only ones with access to certain domains, then you can have multiple people override that person's password and break the glass on the domain but it will require multiple people at that point. So this is kind of a more complicated feature, but it uses a fun algorithm that would be fun to integrate with again. Uh, and we're hoping to get to that someday. Um, and honestly, we want to do support for more types of secrets. Right now, we're just using it for API keys, and that really covers our use cases. But arguably, we could do deeper integrations with things like PGP or something like that. Um, arguably, I don't know. We haven't needed it yet. So. Yeah, I guess I'll just end by saying, why don't you try it out? Here are the links. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. How do you manage the key custodian for your production uh, environments? Like, is, is that just an environment variable and then they have the Right. So, uh, yeah, exactly. Basically, um, when it, so the, I think you, everyone heard the question, but basically it's like at some point, like whenever you, you talk about security, you're going to end up having something called a bootstrapping problem, right? There needs to be some way, like somebody eventually needs to have like the real key. At PayPal, um, like you had uh, release engineering actually entering a password when uh, processes got restarted. Right? Every time the process restarts, someone needs to enter a password that would uh, decrypt all of the SSL certs that would enable, enable client auth. And so it bottoms out in that person. For us uh, on Heroku, the security bottoms out in environment variables that um, most developers don't have access to and are properly sort of like sanitized uh, when it comes to debug outputs and so forth. If you, um, so basically we take that single value and we turn that into access to many values that live inside of our protected YAML. Um, this is another issue with basically having n number of environment variables be your security, because eventually one of those is going to leak through a stack trace somehow. You know, so eventually someone's going to take an os.env dump and like, you know, that'll end up, uh, you'll end up having to rotate your secrets. So um, another reason why it's better to have just one very secure value than many somewhat secure values. More questions? All right. Well, oh, if thank you, have, you thank you, Mohammed. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, if you have.